The olden days really sucked, huh? Polio, measles, colonialism. Conditions were far from optimal. No wonder there was a war every Tuesday. Imagine you're just chilling at home and then some idiot shows up speaking gibberish, and now you have to work for this guy so that his cousin doesn't get more farms on some distant continent. Living conditions were no better, and travel, forget about it. You might as well jump in a barrel and sail to America. We need someone to figure out a way to make things suck a little less. Change starts with you though, doesn't it? No, change starts with this guy. In order to make that change a reality, he bought a defunct shipping line. Now, just follow me here. This company is a little thing I like to call the White Star Line. This is a man named Thomas Henry Ismay, and with his German pal Gustav Christian Schwab, they were out to build the most revolutionary ship of 1870, quite a memorable title today. During a game of billiards, which I think is British pool, Schwab said he'd finance the line if they exclusively used his nephew's shipyard to build their ships. Ismay said yeah whatever, and the concept of the RMS Oceanic was first conceived. Now although Ismay probably didn't intend on increasing the quality of life for the whole of humanity in the process, he designed the Oceanic to have far superior living conditions compared to that of rival shipping companies. This was done purely out of economic incentive, I can assure you. Ismay was an intelligent businessman, and instead of doing the bare minimum for travelers like other shipping lines, <clears throat> he would slowly but drastically raise the bar in passenger accommodations. This way, people would chase after his ships like Apple products. Only in this case, Ismay's accommodations were superior to others, and Apple products are pretty much the same crap everyone else offers. Now Ismay and his naval architect friends decide to lay out the plans for the Oceanic, which would set some White Star standards that carried on through the rest of the company's existence. Firstly, her name was specifically chosen with the suffix IC. This suffix would become the standard for nearly all White Star Line ships. Her funnel was also to be the White Star standard, as most shipping lines had a somewhat unique funnel coloring to distinguish them from their rivals. Now ships of this era would generally be designed at a 1 to 7 ratio for breadth and length, but Oceanic was far longer with a 1 to 10 ratio. This ratio gave her a quick and sleek profile, with the exchange being that she rolled in tough conditions. She had one funnel, one propeller, two cylinders, and four masts with full rig sails. This was still the early days of screw steam propulsion, so although sails were not technically the primary means of acceleration, they were an excellent addition to Oceanic's arsenal. Oceanic's passengers were split into saloon class and steerage class. Saloon class passengers were berthed in their own rooms located higher up on the ship, all of which were fitted with electric bells to call stewards. Their dining saloon was 3,200 square feet, which was pretty spacious at the time. They had pretty sweet deck access too, and got to experience the full luxury of the White Star Line. Now steerage class passengers, they're a little less fortunate. Now to White Star's credit, these conditions were absolutely bonkers to your standard 1870s peasant, and only seem inadequate when looking at it from a modern perspective. About 1,000 steerage passengers could be crammed onto Oceanic, and they were divided up throughout the hull into three primary groups. Single men would be berthed in the bow, families would be berthed amidships, and single women would be berthed in the stern. This was done for married men to act as a barrier between the single women and potentially quote-unquote misbehaving single men. It was an effective setup. Steerage passengers were set in large open rooms with benches and bunk beds, as it was steerage, and this room would be where they would spend 90% of their time on board. Now one problem people faced on inferior shipping lines was that if you had to use the john, you had to cross a deck to get there, even in stormy weather. Oceanic wouldn't have such limitations, and made accommodations for that too. Little stuff like this is the attention to detail Ismay and the White Star Line wanted to go after. They even broke standard by using metal railing for passenger decks instead of bulwarks, which is oddly enough a cool thing to do back then. Well, let's get on with it then. Come on, get her launched and let's see her maiden voyage. Well, the voyage went exquisitely. Not a cloud in the sky, they made it to New York faster than any other ship by far. Hmm, that would be nice. They didn't make it a day out of England before having to turn around because of overheated bearings. Not a great start, but it can't be worse than the Great Eastern exploding on her maiden voyage. Hey, no matter where you are in life, you can never be worse than the Great Eastern. Alright, from here it's pretty much smooth sailing. Now Oceanic certainly wasn't flawless. Her engine was a little underpowered, she rolled in storms due to her length, and she lacked a breakwater causing waves to flood her decks during storms. That's why in 1872 she got a refit that gave her a foxhole, a breakwater, two new boilers, and they shortened her masts to lessen rolling. She continued with White Star on the Atlantic until March 11, 1875, which is the day after my birthday, and she was formally chartered to the Occidental and Oriental Steamship Company, a shipping line centered more on the Pacific and East Asia. She was placed on the San Francisco, Yokohama, and British Hong Kong route. The Oceanic still had White Star officers, but was given a Chinese crew as she would mostly be running Asian immigrants to America. 
And it's not exactly uncommon knowledge that treatment of Asian people by the British and Americans was subpar. Now, the Oceanic was an incredible addition to the O and O line, as now they had a relatively large, fast, and very fancy ship at their disposal, especially when compared to the rest of their fleet. And she certainly put on quite a show for the O and O line when she set a record on her voyage from Liverpool to Hong Kong preparing for her transfer, by accident. In 1876, she set a record from Yokohama to San Francisco. She was getting cocky, and beat her record again soon after. She was the crown jewel of the O and O line, and she knew it. She sailed flawlessly with incredible grace. She was sort of unstoppable, and proved it when she pulled a Jackie Chan on the SS city of Chester and rammed her around where the Golden Gate Bridge would stand decades later. Oceanic was fine though, this is her video. 25 years after her launch, Oceanic was becoming dated. In 1895, O&O did not renew their contract, and she was returned to the White Star Line. A much older Ismay believed there was still value in Oceanic, and returned her to Harland and Wolf to be fixed up. It was discovered, however, that deep corrosion and years of poor upkeep had rendered her unusable. Oceanic was scrapped soon after. So there you go, folks, the legendary liner that started it all. You can stop requesting it now. So what did we learn? Change the world and buy yourself a shipping line.